Thank you. Big up, um, DJ Fifi. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, hello to everybody who's watching online. My name is Dr. Alima Gray. I am the lead curator for Beyond the Baseline. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen the exhibition, um, but this program of events falls within Beyond the Baseline's kind of program. And for those of you who don't know, Beyond the Baseline is a partnership project between the University of Westminster, the Black Music Research Unit headed up by Dr. Michael Riley, and it's all about thinking about Black British music heritage. It's thinking about our responsibility right now in the library, and we're playing music, so the responsibility that the library has in telling stories and telling histories around African and Caribbean contribution to the kind of popular British music. So the exhibition is open until August 26. So if you haven't seen it, do check it out. And this event is a very important one. Um, for those of you who have been in the exhibition, you realize that we start with Africa. That's the starting point. We start in the ocean and we're thinking about African contributions to musicality. And so there's no better way to do this than this panel, this discussion this evening with um, you know, one of the leading spokespersons, DJs, presenters, com comedian um, uh, at the forefront of contemporary African cultures. So it is with a great pleasure and with joy to introduce Eddie Caddy, as well as a amazing panelist um, to, the, to, the, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hello, guys. Hi. I know that was a very formal introduction as well, and I, and I really appreciate it. I feel like a university lecturer with that, and that is the most uncomfortable position to be in. Um, but welcome, welcome. This is incredible for me. Uh, first and foremost, I want to just thank the British Library. Um, I was just having a conversation with my panelists, and I was like, man, I had a library card when I was younger, yeah? But I only used it twice. They never got their books back, so... <laughs> I'm probably going to get arrested before I leave this place. Um, but also the Playmaker group, uh, my mentor, Mr. Ray Paul, please give him a big round of applause. You know, um, this, this guy has been mentoring me since 2008. My first stint on radio was because of him. I understand how to, you know, pre present and convey the message uh, through audio, um, digital, because of this man here. And um, here we are on this journey, like 16 years later, and still kicking it strong. And we're at the British Library talking about African music. Yeah. Which is wonderful. I said to my dad, I'm going to the British Library. He said, oh, you're still studying, my son. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Say, yeah, big man. No, we're going to a rave. You understand? <laughs> um, and I'm also here with one of my, my good, good friends, um, DJ Fifi. Um, a, a Ghanaian born, raised in the UK. But um, the reason why he's here specifically, and I'm going to you know, break down the reason why everybody's here, because there are specific reasons why I chose these panelists, is because the guy I talk to about not just music, but a life in general, um, you know, I recently found out a lot about his upbringing. I've um, known him for years, and I thought he was born here. Then I found out he wasn't. He was born in a place called Takarade, so, uh, some, <laughs> somewhere, in, somewhere in Ghana. And then, you know, we went down this rabbit hole of, of talking about culture and music. So, uh, but he's, gonna, he's going to be uh, the soundtrack to our conversation today. Um, so, of course, 500 years of black British music um, the contribution is vast. I feel like, for me, I've only kind of just been around, you know, the past 15 years. But I think when it comes to African music, and especially with the rise of Afrobeat, um, you know, it's, it's been quite impactful the last 15, 20 years. And I've been privileged enough to be part of that journey in my own special way. And I've met some incredible people along the way, for sure. Um, before I introduce my panelists, I, um, I want to kind of, you know, let me just, so, because this is fun. I've never done this part before. Oh, this has always been my dream to just be pressing slides. You yeah, understand? Um, so, okay. So, this here is my grandmother. Uh, her name is Mbembo Maswaku Bernadette. You know, we always have those French names. Belgian colonial influences. Um, but this is the woman who pretty much raised me my first nine years in Congo. And, um, and there are songs that I hear, right, and that, instantly takes me back home. 
like instantly. There are moments when I hear the music and I just think of my grandma, whether she was, you know, she used to have a bar and I'll be with her or she would sell bread. She had a farm. This woman was like, you know, she was an entrepreneur. But those have been the soundtrack to my life. And, you know, I didn't know anything else but Congolese music and a lot, a lot of Congolese gospel music as well before coming to this country at the age of, uh, of, of nine. Yeah, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, guys. And there's a reason. I'm so glad you cropped that top half, right? Because my, my uncle used to mess up my haircut, man. He used to mess me up. Um, but, you know, so, so Fifi, there's a song called Obey. By, yes. So listen to this song. Right? Okay. And any Congolese in the house? So this song here is by a, a guy called Simaholu Tumba, who is one of the greatest songwriters in Congo, right? But I only recently really found out about him, and even one of our panelists has schooled me on him in the past few years. He's like so wise when it comes to Congolese music. But this guy, he passed away two years ago. And he was, I was one of the last few people to have a conversation with. I was privileged enough with my friend Mohombi, who's a Congolese artist. And I got to uh, meet him, and he was 90. We had a great conversation, but just to meet him brought me to tears because it was like, man, you remind me of my grandma. I can feel, I can smell, I can hold my grandma right now. And the fact that I get to talk to you about this soundtrack to my life was amazing. So this is me and um, Mohombi. A Congolese Swedish brother of mine, a great artist, and we had the pleasure to go and meet Zimaholu Tumba um, in his last days. And he actually got his band to perform this song. Guys, I cried like a baby. It was, yeah, I really, really did. So, um, just so you understand, so this is where I'm coming from before even coming, you know, to this country. If you hear this kind of sound, these are the kind of sounds that was roaming around my house, whether it was gospel or, you know, it's circular music, as you know, they would call it. And then I came to the UK and then discovered all these great people and realized, no, I've got, there's more black people to Congo, you know? You understand? And I met all types of people. And then, so some of the people I've come across, I'm going to introduce now. So the first person who is going to bless us today, sit down with us, this guy here, when I finished university and I was pursuing my career in entertainment and you're still queuing up and paying to go into parties. Yeah, especially the, the few Afrobeats one we had, which was dominated by Ghanaians, but Nigerians mainly. This guy here was the name that was roaming around all the time. Um, he, he's a pioneer when it comes to what we're hearing modern day Afrobeats now. These guys were doing raves secretly. You know, you don't even know what's going on, but they're somewhere hidden, somewhere in South London or East London. Um, and he's a friend till now. He's someone that I see as, as my elder. I respect him highly, but the fact that he has set pace on what we enjoy now is very, very important for you guys to meet, and I'm so excited for you guys to meet him. He goes by the name of DJ Abbas. <laughs> Chairman! <laughs> please, 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 yeah. No, that, that, this is my, I'm the chairman today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the next person, uh, my, this is my sister. Um, we used to have secret meetings, honestly. Um, I, I don't know, should I use the word secret? But we used to like, he, she'd invite me to chill and talk about, so what, you know, what do we do with what's happening with African music right now? This time, it was none of her business, apart from the fact that she was African. At the time, she was a publicist working at Warner Music Group, and she was looking after, you know, people like um, Sean Paul, Ed Sheeran, but she goes as far back as working with artists like Estelle. She was in the game for a while. She had really no reason but passion to say, Eddie, I'm seeing all these young artists coming through. You know, the David O's will kind of just start coming through, the Whiz Kids, and we'll meet up and we'll have conversation about how she could help, because she was at the label space. But, you know, albeit... You know, even though she was Zimbabwean, I kind of feel like myself being Congolese, we kind of wanted to just get in there because these Nigerians and Ghanaians were really enjoying, you know. But years later, we still knock heads, but she's in a much more specific position as the director of African music at Sony. And now she works with artists like Whiskey and David O, um, as close as you can imagine. Her name is Taponeswa Mavunga. There she is there. <laughs> Happy. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, my sister. Uh, uh, yes. And um, how are you feeling? Good. The hair's looking fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, this guy here is a brother of mine. I admire him, I respect him. Um, he's a guy who, I, I call him a genius, literal genius, because it's the way he's been able to sort of transform 
his career. When I first met him, he was an illustrator, graphic designer, um, and I had met a lot of Congolese graphic designers, so I was already curious. And then um, we just started working together. Like, he, he pushed me to kind of, like, take my branding to another level, right? And then around that time, he started to show more interest in entertainment, you know? And it's crazy because at the time, I kind of looked at him and I thought, bro, just stick to what you're good at, man. You're, you're, you're pushing it. You're begging it. Stop. You know? Yeah, stop, man. Just stick to what you... But he, he was studying all along. And in the past seven years, he has really showed his potential. This, the reason why we were so close... He brought me closer to my culture. Like, there were things I never understood, like listening to certain artists like Kofi Olomide, Papa Wemba. He's a, he's a bit of a, a geek. He would sit there and tell me, yeah, you know Papa Wemba was born in this year, and this is how we started. He would tell me stories. That was his vibe. But seven years later, he one of the things he always told me is that he wanted to see, you know, the space for francophones, you know, uh, especially Congolese music, to have a space here in the UK. And he's been able to achieve that. Um, he, he, he owns a, a, a networking space for the Congolese community. What the francophone community? community called Congo to Global, but he recently, um, you know, put together a fantastic concert because Congolese music has not really had concerts here for over 20 years, and Fali Pupa, one of our biggest expo, performed at Wembley Arena, close to 10,000 people, and this gentleman, beyond many other concerts, has been able to do it. But the reason why I have him here today, because I want, him to, I want you guys to also understand is that, we you know, the continent has regions that we've all been able to contribute. Tapaneswa is from Zimbabwe, by the way, so we're going to get into Southern African music as well. And me being Congolese Central and East Africa, and so is this brother here, his name is Moko, make some noise for him. Fantastic. Right, so guys, here's the thing, right? Because, you know, I wanted it to be like we're in my living room. And by the way, somebody is going to um, kind of like do a little coup d'etat and uh, turn up here, um, a very special somebody, but when they turn up, I will introduce you guys. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I just want to be treating you smart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, guys, <laughs> here's the thing, right? For me, um, where do I even start? I was explaining to the guys, I grew up um, in this country from the age of nine, but between the age of nine and I was up until university until around 18, Congolese music was the center of my life when it comes to African music. You might get the odd, you know, you might hear some sounds coming from Southern Africa, Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, you know, uh, Miriam Makeba, you might hear Yusundu from Senegal, but generally it was Congolese music, unless as a West Londoner, there was garage, you know, <laughs> small R&B, you know, but that was essentially it, until I got to university, and then I started to open up to just the diversity and the richness of African music. Tapaneswa, mm -hmm. where were you born and how long have you been in this country? And I'm not immigration, <laughs> so you don't have to worry. Those sort of questions, Eddie. No, I know, I know, it's triggering. So... No, no, don't worry, they've knocked off the Rwanda thing, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Um, oh my god, I'm in trouble. No, um, so I was born in a place called Musana, which is a little village just half an hour, maybe 40 minutes outside of Harare in Zimbabwe. So, ooh, my, my T6 free people are in the building. <laughs> um, and I moved to this country when I was four. You know, my parents had um, moved over here. This was, even though I'm only 21, um, <laughs> this is I just see it, I see Zimbabwe it. was still going through, you know, um, independence. They were, there was a huge, you know, battle for, you know, for independence. And my dad and a whole group of, you know, there were quite a few Zimbabweans that had left the country to try and play their part um, in in this country. Um, and as uh, independence was gained. Um, my parents said, we'll stay for a little while until the children are educated and then we'll go back. And, 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 and we're still here. <laughs> no, it's about, about Zimbabwe, um, it, you know, great contribution uh, to music. Were you listening to a lot of, clearly, um, mm -hmm. a lot of Zimbabwe music, but then what was the atmosphere like outside when you left? Were you still exposed to African music back then? So I wanted to paint the picture of what it was like for you here in the yeah. UK. At, I mean, at age. the thing is, you know, in my household, music was really central. You know, it kind of dictated, you know, just how we lived. 
um, music would bring us together at funerals, music would give, you know, whenever somebody died, um, music would bring us together at weddings, you know, so that was how I experienced, and I didn't realise I was experiencing African music at the time, I just was living, you know, but um, as I was growing up, um, I was definitely, I, I grew up in Canning Town, which was, at that time, was like the heart of the National right. Front, right? So I was one of very few black people in my school. Um, all my friends were white, you know, as, as I, and, and I was having a culture shock you know, as a young child, not knowing any different, but obviously listening to the sounds of Spandau Ballet, Madonna. Spandau Ballet. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> just just whatever the the the, na the you know the main music of that time, which was very sort of pop. But in my household, like I said, in Zimbabwe, part of going back to our liberation, um, Bob Marley played at our independence celebration. So, dance hall reggae has been an intrinsic part of like the Zimbabwean experience. It's actually connected to our liberation struggle. So even sort of fast forward to today, you know, we have our own genre called Zim Dancehall. So um Which you will not stop telling me about. <laughs> She's on my yeah. emails every two days, Ed, <laughs> an update. Yeah, so it was very, very eclectic. I listened to absolutely everything, but definitely Growing up, it was a lot of uh, the stuff that my dad would listen to, and that would be reggae. Um, it was Miriam Makeba, Hugh Masekela, and then obviously the Zimbabwean greats like Thomas Mabvuma, Oliver Mtukudzi, you know, just... Um, Oliver, Oliver's a, 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 a... If you've never heard yeah. of Oliver Mtukudzi, how do you say his surname? I've always struggled. Mtukudzi. Mtukudzi. Yes. Beautiful. Oh. Fantastic Mtukudzi. artist, if you've never come across him. This. What shall we do? And you might, you might have the new generation here who are almost what like, was burn up boy, man. Neither you guys are like to have burn up boy if it wasn't for these people here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, but I, I can imagine these are the, you know, soundtracks to a soothing home. Mum, dad, and that vibe as well, you know. Uh, you're eating the food and, you understand, family's yeah, yeah. coming over. It, it, yeah. was the same, it was the same for me. I mean, I didn't also start to kind of see the younger generation of artists, like or what we'll call sort of modern day Afrobeats. And so I started traveling, you know, I'm seeing, you know, people like Sarko Day eventually um, at some point. And, but even then, I was still very much attached to Congolese music. Mm -hmm. And with Moko, whenever we have conversations, bro, you're like an old wise man. Like, it's like you've lived a thousand years because I always ask, where do you get this information from? Because sometimes they'll tell me stuff, I'll go and fact check it, you don't know this, I do not believe you. So I'll go home <laughs> and I'll fact check, I'll say, oh my gosh, he's right. Where did you get that from? Where, where, where did you get all this information about, you know, Congolese artists, like to the depth that you, you, you actually convey with me? Oof, that's a good question. My dad was actually a bodyguard to musicians. So there was a click. So you have Maitre Gims, his father, yeah, who was a, my dad's friend, a big okay? Frank so you have Papa wow. Wemba, you know yeah. what I mean? So there was like a click. Some of them will become musicians and some of them will become their bodyguards. Do you know what I mean? So that's how it happened. So I grew up around all that. Everything is happening in my house. So what happens is we left home in 1997 and we had to leave home because you know, the new president came in, Mobutu had to leave, and my father was working with Mobutu. So what actually happened in the area that we were growing up in was there was a lot of things going on. There was a lot of friends of my dad and my dad himself, so some of them would become musicians, and my dad went into politics, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very, very, very exposed to all that, so that's how I knew about politics and music and everything, because it was all around me, mm -hmm. as I happened, yeah. You, 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 you knew a bit too, a bit too much. Uh, uh, <laughs> he was too exposed, bro. Too exposed. Too exposed. But you know, it, it's paid off though, for sure, right? So this guy here, Abbas, we just found out that I'm not sure how many people have gone to Nottingham Carnival, All right? So how many people have gone to the Nigerian corner? All right. If All you, of us. Okay. Right. So Abbas is, you know, the, the, one of the founders of the Nigerian corner in Nottingham Carnival, but. They were going back and forth, you know, um, between them. And Tapanesa was saying, do you know what? Like, yeah, you know, I used to go carnival, but we didn't really have an African influence until much later on. And Abbas, you said, what year did you have the first Notting Hill Carnival Nigerian corner? 
So, um, the Nigerian presence at the Northern Carnival started, um, as in physically, started in 1986. There was a gentleman called Obalende Suya, who had a little corner on Cambridge Gardens, where he used to come and sell Suya, and he had a ghetto plaster playing Felas music. And then we came on board in 1999 when he kind of invited us and said, look, let's jazz this thing up a touch. And then we had a DJ set, and then it grew bigger. Fast forward today, 38 years later, the Nigerian Corner, now it's in the Nigerian Corner, Afrobeats Corner, yes. is thriving and kicking and representing um, the Nigerian brand across the world. I'm glad you changed the name to Afrobeats Corner because. No, no, we, <laughs> I mean, according to the Nigerian Corner, you might as well say congestion chart. <laughs> 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 it wasn't fair. Give yourself. But, no, but, you, but you know, I said earlier, I said earlier, and you know, I say this with a warm heart. You know, we, we certainly had predominantly, in terms of influence in the music, you know, we had, uh, it was a Nigerian and Ghanaian, and in this country, the West Africa influence, you know, is, is quite clear. Um, but I was welcomed into that space just because, like I said, you know, as when you're in the UK, as Africans, we're one. Man. You know, it's when you go to the continent, we all get off the plane and we go in our separate places. But here we are one, and I was, I felt a sense of belonging, you know? Um, I recognized myself with the Ghanaians, the South Africans, the Zimbabweans, the Kenyans, the Ethiopians, and that's how I was able to make friends with, you know, a lot of people that are privileged to call friends now who have really had an impact in the scene. You know, you're seeing a picture here of um, a very old man. This is how I should look in about 50 years' time. Um, but in the middle there is DJ Neptizo, who's from Vietnam. And he, he's an example of just the influence of the culture and people really uh, adopting the culture, making it their own, right? One of the best DJs, we have a, a, a business partner of Fifi, actually. Thanks for always putting me on guest list. Um, <laughs> and of course, next to Neptizo is Fuso DG. Now, he's from Ghana, um, same country as Fifi. But with Fuse, with Fuse, it was interesting to see someone who was just passionate about music, not necessarily African music. You know, Fuse grew up in this country, South London, um, loved hip hop, you know, loved dancehall, but his whole premise was just, I just love music. And then one day Fuse went to Ghana, like he was actually in Ghana, and I remember at the time, a few of my, uh, my friends, Ricky Davis, we, you know, we all know very well, um, and Ricky was like, a, you know, she was a writer, she loved writing about African music. And we decided that we wanted to start kind of like documenting the influx of African musicians coming in. So during that time, you had, a, you know, Two Face, Idibius, P Square, you know, these great artists. And that time, Fuse went to Ghana and he messaged me and said, Bro, I'm in Ghana, I've not been in Ghana for a long time, and there's just this crazy move that's happening, right? Now, you have to understand. For me, at this time, I'm still really enjoying my stand-up comedy and, 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 and presenting events, but I just love African music. I just hearing, you know, like places that, you know, I'd been to Ghana already by that time, but just understanding how music is now really flourishing and us as diasporans that being welcomed into it was amazing. Fuse went there, mingled with the local stars like Sarko J, who I showed before, and before you know it, he, he came back here with this Azonto sound. And, um, and just to make sure, are you guys very much aware of Fuse ODG? All right. Yes. Excuse me, where are you? <laughs> and Fuse came back with a new sound. He was working with artists back home who were just a phenomenal producer called Kill Beats, a phenomenal artist. Mm. And when he came back here with the sound Azonto, the, the very first song, it was just very catchy. You know, everybody could dance to it, your grandma could dance to it. It was just nice, and it just crossed over straight away. And then we thought it's a one-off. A lot of people thought, how did you feel about that at the time? Um, the first thing I realized, and this is very ironic, that the UK has actually connected me more with my Africanness mm. than Africa. Mm. Wow. Because yeah. um, I got connected to you in the UK, and you've been to my homeland, Nigeria, a few times. But the chances are, if you were living in Africa, that may not have happened. Mm. What I realized, I came. I was born here, came here when I was 23. I won't tell you how old I am now. <laughs> but old enough. <laughs> You're too nice. <laughs> so, but coming into the UK, the first thing I got introduced to was little pockets of African groups. Mm. And there are 55 countries in Africa, and the first few countries that I kind of like got connected with culturally, Ghana, Zim, Zambia, Congo, in this UK. Mm. And we all kind of like merged, 
And then I started playing more of African music as a DJ mm. because of the impact of my closeness to Africans in the UK. Now, in Nigeria, when I was living in Nigeria, my closeness to African music was based on the songs that were hits on Nigerian radio. Mm. So Yvonne Shaka Shaka was massive. Mm. Probably the biggest ever from South Africa at the time. In fact, she said at one point, I look, I think I'm going to adopt Nigeria as my second country. You know, that's how successful she was. She was yeah. But even though I was on the continent, I found out that when I got to the UK, that the continent limited my closeness. Now, that has improved because of what the UK, because we're celebrating 500 years of, you know, black beauty, what the UK has done for most of us here right now. And don't let us talk about music only, talk about food. Mm. Ah, don't start me up. You know? Yeah. Now, I, now I know, I found out Wachi in this UK. Mm. <laughs> I found out uh, Ntaba, Ntaba in this UK. Oh, oh, yeah, I eat Ntaba all the, all the time, you know? You know <laughs> all the elements of the culture have come yeah. together because as a diaspora <laughs> community, we've been able to bunch up. You come into the UK, first you find people that look like you first, you know, and do the, you know, you bunch up and then absorb all different elements of the culture. Do you know how many... African weddings, Nigeria, mm -hmm. the Congo, Congo, That's Ghana, the one. that happened yeah. in this UK. Yes. So the UK has played that. I lost my sister to a Nigerian. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I say that? <laughs> Let me rephrase. Behave yourself. Let me rephrase. My sister married. Hey, man. <laughs> Sorry, as you were. No. So the, 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 the UK, for me, musically, it did that for me. I just started knowing more culture, started understanding it. And then the upside of that is, based on that, I now started getting called back to Africa to do events. Mm -hmm. That is the irony of it. You know, that would probably not have happened if I was in Nigeria to happen to me across Africa. But now, in the diaspora, that is the strength of the diaspora. We are very powerful, mm. very, very powerful because we've shown what we can achieve with the mix of cultures. And music is playing such a significant role in that. So for me, coming to the UK and how has it influenced my music is immense. It's unbelievable mm. and it's across the board. You know, when you're, when you're talking about um, if we weren't in this country, yeah. we wouldn't connect. Probably. Um, enough, no, definitely, I agree with that. And also, like for me, it's like my, my craft has allowed me to go to travel across the continent and meet you know, so many different people, right? Um, but also, there's even people in your own country you wouldn't have connected with Very true. had you been back home. Mm. I probably wouldn't have connected with Marco because he would be doing politics with his dad. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And you're not Mobutu, man. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's the same with, you know, Tapanesra. Like, tell us about this picture here. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> um, that's me um, at a, a wedding uh, of a very uh, influential music manager, music um, a, a person, his name is Eze, who took, who married a South African, and half South African, half Zambian uh, lady. And I'm with Yvette Gale, who's one of the, um, the owners of the Africa Creative Agency with Colin Gale. So that's us at the wedding in South Africa. And I think, I think this picture is testament to how far the culture has come in that Yvette and Colin, they of course relocated from the States, yeah. from the US. Yeah. And um, they so saw- Yvette and Colin are, are basically, they're both, uh, I mean, it, it, Colin is, is, is a British Jamaican yeah. who went to live in the States and um, Yvette is a wonderful, wonderful, you know, woman, uh, African-American and her background is, is PR, yeah. you know, so she worked for many years at Interscope, working with the likes of 50 Cent, you know, you name it, um, across all, you know, black music. Um, and they packed up their things and decided to put their money, you know, they are also huge fans of Africa, of African music, and they took their whole family and moved to Joburg. Wow. And that's where they've been, and they set up the Africa Creative Agency, and for those that don't know, they're the management behind Tyler. A Grammy Award winning wow. South African Tyler, so. Amazing. Give me some water. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> You understand? <laughs> Connection is good. So here's the thing, right? Sinking. Uh, 
uh, I like this picture a lot. <laughs> now, but before I talk about this picture, uh, it, there's, there's so many layers to this picture, um, but it's also at my workplace. Um, and in 2008, like 16 years ago, is where Ray Paul gave me the opportunity to start my radio career. And years later, I now um, a presenter for a, a show that actually quantifies also the impact and the influence and the success of uh, African music in this country. Um, you know, we literally, you know, we conveyed the message from the, the fans who listen to the music. Um, and we're, we're looking at the top 20 uh, most downloaded and streamed Afrobeats um, songs in the UK uh, on one extra. Um, but I have my colleague, uh, who I'm proud to call a colleague, who I also work with at one extra. And, um, but she's from a different generation, man. She's from a generation, like, you know, talking about you connecting with, um, with, with Yvette, the way you've connected. For their generation, it's easy now. They're, they're just <laughs> running around the world with, with, with African music. And, mm -hmm. um, but she's also very much a UK child, you know, um, who is part of the culture. Is hey, God bless you. <laughs> that would be the I'll UK hay fever. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you see, in Africa, it didn't happen. It don't happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but you know, the, and the reason why I have her today is because I admire her. I think, you know, she, and she I don't think she even understands it, but she is it. You know, she, she, what we call a uh, British African, you know? Uh, she kind of swings past both sides, back and forth, in the most unique way. Um, is a leader of our generation, a proud African, uh, but you know, she, she will never hold back in reminding us that, you know, she's also British. You know what I mean? Um, a presenter a curator, and just a very good person. It's the one and only Remy Bergs. <laughs> and, um, and just to be clear, Remy is not late. Remy is actually on time, as um, she, does, she, does, she does the drive time show on One Extra. So she finished at 7 p.m. and got I'm glad you can clear that up. I don't want to look like, you know, I'm not professional. I don't want to say you come on Nigerian time. Remy. Yes. yes. It's cool to be African, isn't it? Oh, top, I mean, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> no, but not, not 500 years. No, not back in the day, 500 <laughs> years. Back in the day, a lot of Africans were half Jamaican at one point. I don't know, you know? <laughs> yeah, but now... I used to say Wagwanu. Yeah, yeah, Wagwanu. <laughs> Wagwanu. Wagwanu. That's what you call a balanced diet. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> now, as soon as you come out of the womb, it's like, um, African. Wow, yes. I love that. And I'm, yeah. I'm happy for them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, um, you present the Drive Time Show, um, which is, you know, it's pretty much... I think, I, we, call, we could radio the radio, man. We could call it a second flagship show after, after the breakfast show, right? Um, a, a one Extra. And uh, One Extra is the station that's been championing black music for over 20 years now. Um, do you feel a sense of responsibility? Like, do you understand what, when we're talking about 500 years of black British music, we're here at, you know, the, the British Library, we're talking about African music, and you're an African, but do you understand the position that you're in every day when you walk into that building? 100%. Um, I think it starts with the community first, you know? Um, and then there's a sense of teaching as well. There's a sense of knowing that people are probably listening to the radio that probably know nothing about our culture, yeah. and the way that they can get in is by singing an Ashake song and they don't even know what they're saying. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, or, you know, uh, different languages and just, like, feeling the, like you say, responsibility to inform, to play and to be proud about it as well. Mm -hmm. And to wheel it up when you don't usually wheel up on a drive time show. Do you know what I mean? You're, just, you're meant to just keep driving, you know? You're not meant to, you know? So, you know, just giving that kind of energy to our genre is, is the best way for me to honour, honour what we've, what, what we've been building and yeah. what we've built. Do you know, before you got here, I, like, I, was, I was talking to um, Tappy about, you know, she was born in Zimbabwe, came at the age of four, and for a long time, you know, pretty much her being exposed to African music was at home. And she, mm. she came outside, spanned out ballet, and, you know, <laughs> Boy George and... <laughs> Wait, wait, yeah. I mean, yeah. Madonna. Madonna. Go, go. Madonna. I was a huge Madonna that fan. Was, I called it like the windy music, because this is what you got. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fantastic music. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that, that's what I love about music, is you, you're able to tell stories of your culture, right? Mm. What was your, tell us about you as, say between the age of like, I don't know, 10 to 18, mm. as an African growing up here, what has been your experience? Ha. Huh. You've enjoyed. I've enjoyed. It's been eclectic, I can't lie. It's been eclectic. Like, I had my, like, 
for days, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had my LCE fireflies. You would not believe your eyes. Oh, what? <laughs> 10 million, right? You know what I mean? I had those days. And then there was an element of, like, dance hall, which, like, you know, it's very raw back there. It's still quite raw, you know? Like, you know, so you were listening to it in private or just, like, in the... In you school, you know what I mean? African home, you're grounded. Do you know what I mean? It's that. As soon as you get to the front door... <laughs> um, and then it was, you know, seeing things like Jay-Z and Linkin Park link up, and you're just like, whoa, those two worlds can come together. Um, and then there was, like, African like Fuji music, you know, I used to like, right. or, or African um, Christian music. Like I used to listen to a lot of Yinka Ayafele. Mm. Like my mum would play that in the car from That's South London. You're Nigerian. I'm Nigerian, sorry, yes. She would play, um, you know, Christian music, praise and worship music in the mm. car mm. for the whole duration of the journey. The same CD on the way back as well, by the way. So you know <laughs> what's coming next. Because God must answer. Because <laughs> God, you know what I mean? He must enter the brain, you know? Um, and then, yeah, so it, it, it ranged a lot, but then there was an era of my life, and I'll say in my teens, where I had, a, I had an alias, it was Funky B. Like, that was my little nickname, and I knew that it stuck as soon as my dad called me Funky B. I was oh, like, wow. he didn't give me that name, but he started, you know... So he, he, was, he was in it. With yeah, my 16th birthday card, he was like, happy birthday, Funky B. That's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, okay, this That's, is stuck, you know? Yeah. And I was just That's obsessed. <laughs> yes, I was obsessed with Funky House, <laughs> and it's like... That was that was me. That was that was my identity back then. Funky House. Like I, I got in trouble in school because of that. Because you know, like there's a lot of drops in Funky House. Yeah. So I used to like get on the table and then <laughs> jump when it drops. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But I've always been like this kind of like large and big, so you can hear it from floors down. Like, as in, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, so I wouldn't. And it goes. It's, and, uh, I'm glad I didn't go to school. With yeah, you. listen. You get me. It was yeah, man. I was misunderstood. I like to say I was misunderstood. So. And, so, um, and I'm glad you've taken us through that journey, Remy, because it's, it's, it goes to show also where we've reached out with Af Afrobeats and African music and the influence of being a diasporan, right? You hear the, 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 the new sound now in African music, it's like there's elements from everything, mm. literally. We've just seen Central C and Ashake do a great collaboration. Yeah. I'm stuck on this picture because Noko, this was a very, like, um, important moment for, for, for us as a as a community, and I think, you know, if, if um, the whole of Africa is paying attention, especially diapo diasporans, it's a moment that we should have all shared, and I believe, you know, a lot of us did, right? Fali Pupa, who's um, the biggest um, Francophone artist right now, as we speak, and um, you put together a concert after almost 20 years of there being an absence of Congolese music. Um, but I want you, just away from this picture, give me a, an important track, an important, Francophone track, you know, or a moment that's really is, is dear to you, you know, um, that we might have spoken about. Well, particularly here in London, or just overall. Overall, because I know you've mentioned you've mentioned some stuff before when we spoke earlier. Okay. Hmm. I would say before I leave home was Loa Kofiolomide. Oof. All right. So that was a very, very transitional time. That's an because, anthem. Yeah. Very, very transitional time. I would say that's the biggest Congolese song, the most famous Congolese song on the planet. Fifi, you, you have Africa or Congo? Congo. Okay. Yeah. So this particular song, when it comes on in a club, leave Congolese people alone. <laughs> Just and, 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 and always play to the end. It lasts about four That's days. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you Mind your business. <laughs> We're getting our steps in. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy because this was a transitional time for the country and everything that was happening because the new president was coming in, the old president was leaving. You know what I mean? And we were leaving out of the country as well. I think 17th of May, 1997. You remember the day you left? Yeah, I remember the that. day. Because that's the day that, you know, came in and my dad lied to us that we only came for a while. You know, we'll be back in three years. Before you know it, we're still here. You know what I mean? So, um... A little bit, but not too long. Yeah, just so they can feel it as he's talking. Yeah. <laughs> just have the balance. <laughs> Give him a sandwich. Talk, my brother, talk. Look, when I'm, when I'm hearing this and I'm thinking, I think... Besides you, who's the first black British to ever headline, you know, the Auto Arena, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, copy, 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 You'll get your 50 pounds, you'll get your 50 pounds. Yeah, pound. so um, <laughs> eight years later, Whiskey did it, isn't it? Whiskey did it. But it's so crazy because 
At this time, 1997 to 19 to 2020, no, no, 1997 to 2001, Congolese was already doing arenas, mm. you know, in Paris, you know, mm. Bercy, you know, no, like, three months promotion, and they will pack a 20,000 capacity venue, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it's just great to see that, you know, when Afrobeat was birthed as well, you know, 28 years later, you know what I mean, and everybody caught up as well and, and everything. It's just beautiful to see that, and I'm in London, and it's all been happening as well. That moment, that picture back, please put that picture back. It's very important. Yes, sir. This moment is so emotional for me simply because we haven't had anything in this country in nearly 20 years, all right? And I've been working with Edison to, from 2013 to 2017. So we just went part ways, all right? Everyone wanted to do their own thing. And within that time, I did, I would say equivalent to Burner Boy, Whiskey and David O. So that's Gims, Daju, and Dyke. I did all of them in that space of five months, mm -hmm. and it was all sold out shows. After that, I just thought I need to step up. All right. And doing all that time, doing all that, I was not doing it with Eddie because we just went part ways. When it came to this one, I said I need to reach out to Eddie because we haven't spoken in how long? A long time. Yeah, long time. It's about seven years we haven't spoken. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'll reach out to him because for the francophone, this was historical. And mm -hmm. putting this at the Wembley Arena, mm -hmm. we had other African shows, and I got a bit scared because all the shows were being cancelled because tickets were moving. Mm. Tickets were moving, so everyone was cancelling. No one could sell more than 3,000 tickets. Three cancellations. There you go. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Sorry, we'll leave it there. Let's not mention them. <laughs> 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 you lose money. Because the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Fali Pupa became the first you know, francophone artist to have a successful show at UK Arena, and we sold 10,000 tickets, you know. And it was just amazing for Eddie to be a part of it as well. Amazing. You know what I mean? Because beside being my friend, or I put the business thing aside, beside being my friend, this guy, as I was on the streets, I was watching this guy, because I would say someone like Eddie Caddy and Sway were the first people to come on TV and say, we're Africans. Mm -hmm. We were all denying it. Mm -hmm. I grew up in, you know, yeah, yeah, Hackney, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Kings, me, London, Field, this is where I grew up. That's in the deep of the ghetto, you know what yeah. I mean? So you didn't really want to say you're Congolese, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he was the first person, him and Sway, to actually see them on TV yeah. and to find out that he was Congolese. He actually doesn't realise he's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing now. This ghetto guy getting soft, man. I'm not <laughs> Be who you are, be proud. Don't get yeah. soft. No, but I, yeah. no. Can I throw a little something in there? Yes, sir. Yes, you can. Um, yeah, please. Like I said, this thing is generational. Mm. And my introduction to Congolese music, because something that, there's a group called Wenge Musica. Oh, yeah. yeah, legendary. So apparently, a lot of these guys came out. To the people that don't know, that's equivalent to NWA. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And a lot of them came out of that group. And that song, Loa, apparently had been performed in different versions. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I knew. And then there's this gentleman called Awido. There you go. So this is now the twist I want to throw in. Yeah. Because I was told once, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you are to count the top five biggest Congolese acts, yes. Awilo would not be there then. Unfortunately. I've heard that. Yes. Doesn't make no sense. But right across the stream in West Africa, particularly in Nigeria, Awilo was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. Awilo did those stadium shows in Nigeria. And I really, and, and, it's not a joke. And, and before you continue, because that's a very important thing, and I, just so we give context, context to yeah. understanding what Moko was talking about in terms of, you know, African music and its influence um, here in the UK, and now now seeing the crossover of uh, French-speaking Africans, mm. and then you know, I will be one of the artists that we were listening to a lot in the clubs here. You know, we'll have like maybe five Afrobeat songs. Yeah. But even for us in Congo, we didn't realize the impact of Awilo outside of Congo okay. yeah. until yeah. I spoke to my fellow Nigerians to realize he was more impactful than any Congolese artist we had at home Fact. across Africa and beyond. So as you were saying. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And this is trying, and that's why we have to be very careful. And de you know, because as we're telling this story, some of us don't even know, like, we told some stories right now. Because at one point I was thinking, okay, there was a time before you, 
A lot of promoters are like, how are we going to do this Congolese, this big Congolese concert here? The numbers are there, the artists are there, but at times, the timing is not there. You need to get the timing right. Mm -hmm. All the elements need to meet at the confluence, and that's what makes it work. So what Moko has done is identifying the timing, mm -hmm. knowing if all those things don't tie up, it never works. Right. You know, identifying everything because like we on the outside, like I play the Congolese, ah, let's do a willow in the UK. And I said, ah, okay, it worked in Nigeria. It may not necessarily work, work in the UK. Yeah. In yeah. the UK, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And London is to West Africa, what Paris is to, it, to Francophone. To Francophone. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So those are the things we are beginning to learn. Sounds of course, we had Eddie, but Eddie alone could not carry the whole no. of exactly. um, <laughs> Congo on his head, but he's done a great job in tying those knots. Those dots, we need to keep connecting them. And, and how do we, how do, because I, I want to understand, on a day-to-day -day basis, right, tap on this one, like, how do you display, you know, your culture as a, as a Zimbabwean, mm. um, as someone who's in a position of, of, of influence and impact and decision-making? Mm. You know, I mentioned earlier, you work, you work closely with, with Whiskey and David, and you have many stories mm. of, you know, you basically call them your children. <laughs> but... In general, you know, having all those things and you're balancing, how do you display the, your culture on a day-to-day -day I mean, basis? I think, I think just like we're living in a time where really authenticity is yeah. the only currency. Do you know what I mean? And that goes whether we're talking about artists, whether we're talking about people, whether we're talking about the executives in the music. You know, it's about being your authentic self and arriving at conversations where you can bring, you know, your whole self. Um, so, you know, my name is Toponiswa, last name Mavunga. Like, you will know my name and you will know that I'm from Zimbabwe. You know, it's not, it's not, um, it's something that, um, that was the only way to survive. And I understand, and, I, and I, going back to something that you had said earlier, I, I just think it's, it's brilliant that you have been able to come at a time where, you know, Afrobeats or Funky House, like, it was just normal. You didn't even see any other way, whereas, you know, we're from a generation where it wasn't that. Yeah. So, actually, there is a huge power within the di diaspora. Um, there is a huge power in owning your power in the diaspora as well, you know, and not getting confused by these separatist, you know, messages that, you know, that only hurt uh, ultimately what culture, mm. right? Um, because when I was, you know, going back in my household, Thomas Mapfuma, Oliver Mutukudzi, Brenda Fassi, Hugh Masekela, you know, Bob Marley, at home, because I'm from that kind of an upbringing, but as... I started raving, I started connecting on the outside. It was very, very, you know, obviously, hip-hop, I'm a child of hip-hop, I'm a child of dance hall. I would sneak out of the house to go to hear Shabba Ranks, <laughs> you know, and all of those sort of parties and, and, and what have you. And, and actually, it was when I realised, I didn't realise that you could actually um, have a job Right. you know, in, in, yeah. in this business. And what started out as me just really loving music and being a bit of a busybody, vice president of the African Caribbean Society, you know, trying to put on things, you know, at so my you was African Caribbean Society? It's ACS. Me too, it's ACS. Hey. Of course. You are a of smart course. girl. Come on. You know, trying to, trying to put on, like, a social life, because I think I was at um, university in Hertfordshire, uh, in Bedfordshire, and... Um, you know, we had one night. It was on a Tuesday. Every second Tuesday was urban night. Right. We don't use that word anymore, but mm. do you know what I mean? So it's like, it, it was really important to be able to, you know, bring my whole self and ultimately connect with other people that brought their whole selves. And through that, through this sort of diaspora network, you know, we, things started to move. And just really quickly, I remember I was working at, um, at Warner Music, you know, my first break as a, as a publicist. Um, and I just remember there was a girl who won Mobo unsigned, right. and her name was Sharice. Yes. She was a young mixed race girl. She was half uh, Jamaican, half um, English. But she was part of a crew that was put Brothers. together by JJ. See the brothers. big brothers, you know, and and I just remember all instantly feeling 
it was really important because um, she's from West London, but she was singing words in Yoruba because the brothers had put, you know, were producing the music. And again, this idea of a diaspora, exactly what you were saying, really, really powerful. And we recognize each other. And you know what? You know what I mean? We just recognize each other and everybody was contributing. And this girl who was mixed race and, you know, not, never been to Nigeria was singing these words. And it was so powerful to have her on the Mobo unsigned stage, which she went on to win a Mobo, singing those, you know, speaking to a, a, a young generation. And, and we have it here now. It, it's even yeah. more so now. You know, like, Remy was saying earlier, oh, there's people that will be singing like Shaka songs, they don't know what they're saying. Yeah. For many years, actually, people, yeah. people were singing a song called Premier Gao, uh, which is a yeah. Ivorian song, yeah? They are still singing it, they don't and, know what it means. They're still singing it. <laughs> that is the ultimate... If, if, you, if, you, if you know this song, you know it. If you don't know it, you now know it. And then, and then you find out it's about a, a guy who's heartbroken. Yeah, but that's like, give me a second. I, I still have a yeah, I still, Come on. Now, <laughs> I'll tell you a little about this song. The way this sound, a lot of people sang this song with joy, not knowing it's a breakup song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a breakup song. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing about African music. It sounds so good. Half the time, <laughs> half the time you guys are talking about, you know, you're talking about loving African music. We will put a very happy beat and we just got dumped and we written a song. Yeah, but it's so crazy because we just I'm finding it. out now, yeah. you know, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, Mook Combo, it wasn't about, it wasn't a gospel song. Nice. Are you it was about beers. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Are you singing yeah. in church? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah. I used to pray with that. <laughs> no, we didn't know that. Oh, we didn't it know that. Is it Tashwala Bam? About You're telling me no, this was a gospel song. So what's the about all that? Yeah. So here's the thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are so many tracks it's and good, songs yeah. that define moments in people's lives, the moment where you fell in love with, you know, uh, African music. Right, the moment where you, 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 you got connected. Like for me, like I, I talk about Congolese music a lot, and you know, hearing songs like uh, Kofi Olomi Days, Loa is big, uh, you know, um, we have Efrakata, which is another um, big song. But I spoke earlier about just listening to this song that, you know, always reminds me of my grandma. But you know, we have other panelists there, um, uh, you know, it, you talked about African, who spoke about African Queen earlier? I did, yeah. Tell me, tell me about that song. African Queen was just, you know, the song... I just remember, for me personally, in, in my career, I remember being at Atlantic. It was sort of early 2000. Um, and when I first heard this song by an African man referencing African women, mm. you know, that was really, really powerful because, like I said, I was a hip-hop, you know, and there was a lot of songs about being half Chinese, half black and half Asian and, you know, uh, light skinned with small eyes. But actually to hear, you know, a man like Two-Face talking to black women, African women, you know, um, yeah, that was very, very powerful. And I think it was the first video to ever be played um, on MTV when it launched. In, I think we should just give Africa. MTV Africa. Africa yeah. We, yeah. We, should, we should give African this song here um, just a moment. Just a moment. It's a, it's a moment. It freezes me in time. It takes, this gave me confidence in that we have a bright future. Girl of my dreams, you take me where I've never been. You make my heart go ding a little bit. Oh, you are my African queen. Tap yeah. <laughs> it, this is a nice picture of you. <laughs> you look like you're going to carnival in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> so, with um, African Queen, Two Face, one of the greatest artists mm. that, you know, has ever come out of the continent, and he actually no just, you know, he transcended okay. the culture, you know. Um, this song was big in the Caribbean, Ray, can you confirm? Yep. Yeah. And my Caribbean people, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, no, yeah. you was always in the Caribbean, don't pretend like <laughs> you weren't taking that much time off work. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was massive in the Caribbean. He started appearing in, in, in US, uh, you know, chat shows. You know, the influence was just, <coughs> like, intense. And we spoke about, you know, Fuse ODG and his moments. Mm. And 
I've always said the reason why it was it's such a privilege for me to be in this building right now and kind of you know share my journey and my love uh, in the most authentic way for the culture and, and African music and sit down with people that have held my hand throughout this time as well, is to be able to bring out those moments, those little pockets of, it's almost like a booster of like, oh no, this is real, like, oh my God, like, you know, another moment gives, it buys us another 10 years, you know? And um, there was a moment, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint the picture to you guys, right? Um, you know, I, I've gone around the world uh, kind of hosting and presenting um, shows and I love presenting and I love hosting shows, but when there's a, a meaning to it, 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 it gives it a different touch. And we just had a moment during, you know, um, it was a New Year's countdown. And, um, and you have to understand, diasporans, mm -hmm. they always say, we come here to find a better life and hopefully we can go back home and create mm -hmm. a better life for ourselves. <coughs> and some of us just take a bit longer. Some of us decide, nah, there's nothing back home for me. I'm good. <laughs> Western Union, Islam. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know how hard, how hard England is, right? And there was, there was a young man who had that story, you know? Um, he was here trying to make ends meet, make it work, uh, love music like we all do, uh, connected with his friends. Tapanessa mentioned uh, JJC and 419 Squad, a very influential group mm -hmm. who uh, were able to really open doors for so many artists, you know, uh, a, a crew of, of young Nigerian, um, you know, men and women. And through and that, even, we had big And even the song, We Are African. And like, we, there you go, yeah, David Owens yeah. featured on a track with them, you know? Um, but there was a guy who, this guy was also a part of them. He was, you know, trying to make it uh, a mean player of the harmonica. I don't know anyone else in this world that plays the harmonica, to be <laughs> fair, he's the only one, right? But he was a guy, just like I said, the, the typical diaspora story, really trying to make it work, and music was his path. And when we talk about bridging the gap, as you said, some of us will never have met, even if we were back home. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And some of us have met here, even though we're from the same country. Indeed. And he met another one of his fellow Nigerians. They went back home and they created a new wave of sound. They combined diaspora music mm -hmm. and, of course, music from back home. And I think this was the first time for me where I said, the same impact we can have back home, mm -hmm. we can have here. Indeed. And during that New Year's, when I heard the countdown of New Year's in British television and they played this guy's song, it changed first. It, ch yeah. first. first yeah. it changed everything. And he wanted to have an illustrious career, but has opened many, many doors. And you know what? I forced him to come today because I just felt like I couldn't talk about him behind his back. And I wanted him to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on here. <laughs> the one and only Bangali Dibanj. Music and still have the same energy. <laughs> you know, what is it about you and you? I feel like your character has remained the same, my guy. Yeah? What is it about you that keeps that character the same and you keep applying it to your music? <clears throat> I'm the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so humbled being here. You know, you mentioned that you're with people that held your hands as I walked in. And that's literally what I have here too, you know. There's such a great connection to the story when we get there. But I believe it actually starts from there. Um, being real to yourself, I've always been like this. Um, I've always been energetic. I've always been positively driven and always looking for the next opportunity. So uh, for me to have had the privilege in this wonderful market 20 years ago, this October 2nd or 3rd? 3rd. 3rd. I was mm. such a young boy. I'm 
still very young. I'm 24. Right? <laughs> Everybody in the 20s. No yeah. <laughs> and I was so young, and and I had an opportunity. It was an acne at the Nigerian Independence Day. Ocean. Oceans. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oceans. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, acne. Yes. And I was a member <laughs> of that group. You mentioned JJC 419 Squad. In fact, I was one yes. of the smallest, youngest, uh, what do you call it, church rats. <laughs> boy at that time. And um, I was given an opportunity, five minutes. No one knew me. And the person that gave me that opportunity is right here, DJ Abbas. Yes. I remember backstage, JJC saying, listen, if they allow you to perform, you know, then you can perform. And my, um, my brother, Don Jazzy, you know, my producer, went to meet you. He had a relationship with you. I knew you too as my egg boy. Still, how can we not know him at the band? <laughs> the band but, was around everybody. <laughs> but he said to me, okay, go and do one song. And I think, to answer and crown that question is you only have the first time to create first impression. that first that's impression. Mm. So that five minutes I was given is the same five minutes I see every time till tomorrow. Do you know what? I, I want to kind of scan through everybody and just tell me that moment when Oliver Twist came out and we all felt that influence, you know? Even if, you know, you, you, you didn't even... You weren't even into music, you felt it. Mm. Just a quick scan from Moko all the way to Abbas. You know, what that moment was... Man, it's crazy because, first of all, growing up in Congo, I haven't actually heard any Nigerian music. Right. So my first Nigerian music was African Queen, first of all. Okay? From, you know, mm -hmm. Two-Face. But being from the hood and watching MTV bass and actually seeing African accent there, you know what I mean? In, you know, British mainstream, we would call it. That changed everything. That changed everything. So I can actually step out of London Fields or, you know, Kingsville and say, yo, I'm Congolese, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, that's what it did for us, because you guys, like I said, you and Sway did it, but you guys are Londoners. You grew up in London, you know what I mean? But my man went back home. You know what I mean? And claimed it, yeah. You know what I mean? And now we've seen him on TV mainstream. That was different. Really? For us, hood man. I'll be honest with you. I'm Skabanj. <laughs> That's, you know what I'm saying? That was, that was, I used to say that randomly. I'm Skabanj. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if I'm butchering it, but that was, in, that was in my lingo at one point. Um, and I think Oliver Twist was, was like, the nail, like, was like, oh, we're, we're staying. We all can do it. It was, yeah, and I think there was the, the moment in the video where he was endorsed by Kanye West and everyone was like, sorry, sure? rewind. Oh, wow. The hoodie, everyone That's was it. like, what? what? Like, so yeah. I think yeah. that was the moment where we were like, oh, like, we're here to stay. Yeah. We're here. You know, um, and it's crazy you talk about the video, right? Because, you know, he gave me f a five-second appearance on that video. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, he was on everyone's <laughs> video, though. <laughs> Fuck him! He was a director. He was a director. He was a director. He was a director. So I made sure I wore a Congolese tracksuit just in <laughs> No, but being on that set, and, and you, you know, kept whispering in my ear, he said, Kanye's coming up. This person is coming. And it was just like, no, he's not. And then it happens, and then I realized this guy's on the way. Yeah. But during that time, once you had done the video, and then you, you, you had a remix of a song with uh, Undow with Snoop Dogg. Mm. And then it coincided around the time where Tapping S was. I said to you guys at the start of this conversation, Tappy would be the person that would come and say, What can we do, Ed? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bored in the I don't speak like that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make you. <laughs> I want to make changes. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do as a Zimbabwe? <laughs> yeah. Right, so, and then she was aware that the band was in town with his entire crew, and, um, you know. Well, she, do you know what? Actually, I will take it, I'll take yeah, it back. It wasn't that she, he, was, he was in town for that. I remember 
like even before that, Way like back. from Mohit, yep. right. you know, Dr. C. Dr. Sid yep. and Don Jazzy. Don Jazzy, everyone came to yep. Atlantic, actually. They yep. came and even, hung out on the even Don Jazzy one day like call. That. Yeah, John yeah Jazzy you were doing came. some secret work. Yeah. I mean, so on two, on two counts, I'm a fan of African music, but I also work within music. Yeah. And I think what that song did was to really give the confidence that what a lot of us were speaking about at the time, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that we weren't crazy, mm -hmm. you know? That the fact that you guys were able to sell out O2 Indigo mm -hmm. in the Mo Hits iteration yep, yep. with just what we would call street heat. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, where is it? And just taking you back, this was at the same time I was working with, like, Flo Rida, mm -hmm. who had a number one song, yep. was also trying to sell out the same venues and we were running ads all across radio. Mm -hmm. But then if you compared it to what was happening in Africa, sold out. Yep. So that song in 2012, when I, I remember calling my sister, I don't know if you know, people will know my sister and I as well, um, and we were just so excited about what this could mean. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But secondly, I, I was there at Hammersmith mm -hmm. and we'd all seen Kanye the night before uh, yep. at, the, at, the, at, the, at the VMAs. And there was like some rumor that maybe he was gonna come and, you know, and he did. Yeah. And I swear to God, the roof of that it place was, crazy. was gonna, like, it came off, oh, like wow. literally. Yeah. And, and I remember it wasn't just, um, the thing about Afrobeats, it's just joyful music. Everybody was dancing, man, get out. Do you know what I mean? Was Everybody was dancing, and I just thought there is no limitation actually because it's just a celebration. It's it's joy. But what you did with that record, it opened up the airwaves. It opened up Hello. BBC. You know, like actually getting playlists. You know, on a on a, um, yeah, it was a really important. And I say this all the time to the new Amazing. the new generation coming through. And this is where your part is really important. Mm. Um, because we've mentioned, that we've heard names like you, Masakela, Miriam Makeba, Baba Mao, mm. Yusundo, you know, Salis Kita. <laughs> you know, Africa is such a, it's, it's, it's a wide space and, you know, growing up, a lot of people assuming it was a country, even though I think it should be. Um, you know, we do our best to make it borderless. When you talk about the bench, yeah. someone like you as a Nigerian who has experienced the influence of Bella Kuti, mm. how would you kind of summarize where we came from with Fela. Mm -hmm. And the influence is that, you know, Fela was in this country. He was touring with the Paul McCartney's of this world. He took them back home. Absolutely. And many artists, we can, you know, we talk about their willows and their Kofi Olomi days, mm -hmm. Papa Wemba with Peter Gabriel. These are all real influences in this country, but how would you compare the moment that it happened with the band, <coughs> kind of summarizing it from a Fela moving forward? The thing is, a lot of this conversation is very generational. Mm. And how a 50-year-old absorbs it is a bit different from how a 40-year-old sees it, 30, 20, and all the way down. The band is the first, first Afrobeat superstar. Fact. No argument. Fact. The first Afrobeat Fact. superstar. <laughs> and Fact. all the indices are there. They. I don't want to go into this paving the way conversation, you know, because it seems to have been taken the wrong way. Mm. But the fact remains that before the front, there's the back. That would never change. So you need to always transport yourself. And when I'm telling this story right now, we're having stadium shows, we're mm. having, but I always transport myself back to that period. Mm. That Ocean 2000 capacity, yeah. that was my West Ham Stadium. Yes, there. that mm. was it. Because before then, there was nothing. Was nothing. There was nothing. Yeah. There was nothing. Because then we were doing little poxy venues, yes. you know, where you are looking for money to pay security at the end of the night, <laughs> or the, you know? And then there was this proper venue where the owner will send you emails. <laughs> <laughs> Because before then they would text you. Not email. Email. No, the owner will send you an email <laughs> that you have to pay the balance, sir. You know? So there was a reason for that, you know? And then we talk about moments. And moments will also vary from individuals to individuals, you know? Yeah. Um, that's 2012 moments. Mm -hmm. um, New Year's Day. 
my wife normally goes to church. Mm. It's a Nigerian thing. Mm -hmm. African something, you know? Yeah. New Year must not meet us at home or in the club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my wife was at home that year. She was the one that called me. Eh? They're playing. <laughs> That was the, the, the um, Oliver Tree, and she called me. And before then, I've got two children growing up at the time. My greatest concern, I say this all the time, my greatest fear was that, how am I going to Africanize these children yeah. in this our diaspora? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do to Africanize them? Apart from beating them, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Okay. And what music, what music has done in Africanizing not yeah. just my children. children but Music has played such a major role. Mm. And these are the indices. Yeah. You know, now Ashake is coming to the UK. I see my younger son coming, you know, and say, Dad, what does this mean? Because there are people online now that actually do they do lessons to teach people who want to at, 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 uh, go to Ashake's concert. <laughs> but that journey started somewhere. Mm -hmm. We must always follow the trajectory, mm -hmm. always. This man mm -hmm. was right, for the, for the diaspora, was right at the top as the first Afro. And look at all the indices, you know. Um, we're talking about, um, and I'm, I'm, I, I shouldn't be the one talking about it because it actually makes me feel a bit quirky because the band is now we, we, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's ticked all the boxes, you know. So I always say, before we go forward, Always follow that trajectory and 20 years on. I'm the band. Oh shit. Oh shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No touch. No. Uh, uh. So, as you mentioned, right? Now, and the reason why I said all those names before even the band mm -hmm. is because they people have lived, I've always said, we've lived these moments before, just in a different way. A yeah. different taste. It's yeah. happened before, yeah. yeah? And we're living through these moments now, but we have the power of technology, of course, with social media. We can really hold on to our stories. Yeah. We can really pass it on to our kids. Yeah. And we're seeing these kind of images here, you know, um, a burner boy and his mother, who is, uh, you know, and, and if I go back and we look at this image here and just to understand, you know, Tapaneswa and Remy are representing just a list of endless, powerful, human beings who are really doing stuff behind the scenes and at the forefront. You know, um, you know, but I, we look at these moments that we can hold on to and say, we're living those moments again. Mm. Just the other day at the London Stadium, Burner Boy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, not too long ago, if you, if you look at Afro Nation, you know, a whole array of artists from Francophones you know, to Portuguese speaking, mm -hmm. you know, but this is for, these are from, um, you know, um, promoters in Smaid, who's f who is a diasporan from the UK. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. That influence came from here, yeah. do you understand? And then, like, we have a whole array of things to look forward to, but I cannot move forward without actually going back to Tappy, so we understand that this new generation of South African music, Mm. Mm. I'm a piano, Guam, that sound has really taken over the world and is also what? selling African music in a different mm. way. I just needed to kind of tell us what that impact has been, even ricocheting back home and how we move forward with that. Well, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, we've experienced this before and what's happening in South Africa is absolutely incredible. Um, I would even say, take it back a little bit, because around the time when Black Panther yes. first came out, the, the soundtrack to that actually yes. was gone, you know? And one of the pioneers of that, uh, uh, two of them, uh, DJ Mapurisa and Kabza de Small, actually went on to then make the I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a Piano wave. Um, and just recently, Spotify um, put out um, their figures and basically the genre has increased by 5,000%. So it is penetrating several different markets. It's going global. Um, it's, I, I, I can't think of a festival that didn't have this music, you know, from the, over the last three years. And um, I'm quite privileged at Sony to work with at least five of the big big ones, um, you know, from that scene. So, yeah, it's I think we're only seeing the beginning of it, you know? And as 
more people collaborate, as we saw Maparusa and um, Kabza with Burner Boy and, and Wizkid, you know, the more people do the, the, you know, I think with Africa, collaboration is key. And that is how the music has been yeah. able to spread. You know, the more we work with people from East Africa and, and South Africa, you know, the music is not going anywhere. Fantastic. Well, guys, so before um, I let my people summarize, you know, as we have been in this fantastic conversation, I'm looking at you beautiful people who have been so engaging with your fantastic faces, making me feel really nice. I want to hear your voices. Um, I, I know I can, I, I can imagine there were moments where you wanted to interject. You wanted to say your piece, there were excitement, are you just holding back? Um, but I'm going to give the floor a chance, you know, to kind of have a conversation with our guys. If you've got any questions, uh, you have a statement, um, this is the moment. So, what do we see there? Is that, Chris, is that Crystal? Crystal. Hello, how are you? <laughs> how are you? <laughs> are you okay? Hi. Uh, Crystal. Um, thank you for the great panel. Um, it's amazing to see those people that I've worked with pushed me. Um, I'd say thank you to Eddie. I'd say he's probably the foundation of why I work in music. Marco's my cousin, so we probably come from the same bloodline of knowing interesting facts about music. Um, and so my kind of question goes to uh, Moko as well about how did you deal with, and maybe to give some background on why we didn't have a lot of Af um, Congolese shows. You know, there was an issue with the combatant and a lot of the combatants saying that actually our artists can't perform here if they're not going to be politically involved, if they're not going to push their agenda to the Congolese government. So how did you deal with that? What, what, like, how, how did you have to strategize around that? Did you have to get any of the combatants on side for the Fali show? And, and what were your fears around that? Oh, that's a good question. I love that. You're well, welcome. First of all, people need to understand what a combatant is. The combatant is just few Congolese in the diaspora who rebelled and they say they don't want the president back home. So to get attention, they say music in the diaspora, Congolese music in the diaspora should not happen. And um, it started in London. So to answer your question, it started in our house. Yeah, so I would say about 80% of those people are uncles, people that I knew. My pops is youngers and stuff like that. So it was easy giving them a phone call. So your house was the reason we couldn't party yeah. your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got from a big man. But say what you're saying. <laughs> and, I understand why you're a politician. And, and the crazy part about it is that I was on the neutral side of it because I understand what's going on back home. And I'm Congolese and, and I'm a Londoner, so I understood what's going on. So as much as people were talking out there, I was busy positioning myself <laughs> when people were talking. So, so I just positioned myself, made a few phone calls. I would say about 80% of them were at the Fali show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there you go. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Those people are called, did they combat? Combatant, yeah. I so freedom fighters. They made us cry. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, those combatter people. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what, they, let me, for context, do you know what they were doing? Uh. Anywhere in Europe mm -hmm. that any Congolese artist was performing, yeah, yeah. they would, they like 300. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They would go no, out. More than that. And in one hour, the police would shut the show down. Yeah. Sure. I wanted to do an Avilo yeah. show once. Yes. I you should have called me. I will say, I will say, this is Willow living in London, oh. Yeah. I said, Abbas, you know, there's problem with these people. I didn't know they were called combatter. Yes. Is, anyone, are you, is any of you here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my good question good. is to B De Banj. My question I wanted to ask you was, your reason, because obviously when I was growing up, I used to see you on like channel AKA after 12 and certain times like that. Your reason for going back to Nigeria, like, you know, it's a hard thing to do to go, to be all right here, you're doing your thing, you know what I mean? Electricity is working, everything is good, no <laughs> nepa, that, you know what I mean? But going back to Nigeria, because you seem like, because I've seen you in Nigeria before, and I've seen the way you live, and it's good life, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> going back to Nigeria. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? I've seen it, so, like, so for the people who, 
can't make that step to go back and are finding it hard to go back because, you know, like, England just holds on to you. What was your reason for going back and what was it like when you first got back to Nigeria? Debanj, before you answer that question, just to give context, the person who's asking the question, and it's, it, it, you know, we, we could be here all day, but he's a very influential young man who was part of the early pioneers of what we now call the sound of Afro swing. His name is Timbo. Right. Swing is testament to African music's influence in Great Britain. You know, it's part of these 500 years we're talking about, and it really set precedence with the Jay Hustles that we're seeing these days as well. So, just to give context of why he's looking into the Banjo's life and wants to go back home. <laughs> so, thank you very much, my brother. I must greet you specially. Um, honestly, Home has always been like the foundation for me. And the industry, even though it was not structured, I kind of, or we kind of felt, myself and Don Jazzy back then, you know, we just felt that what we had was different. I remember when we were working on the album 20 years ago, actually, before going back home, we, we finished the album. And then we would listen to Two Face. Um, we would listen to Style Plus. And Jazzy would say, oh, my man, I love it. There was one kind of a drive for us, like we saw something back home. It wasn't about the money at first. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was more about us going to find and, you know, fully come into our identity. And when I went back home, because we had support from, you know, family, um, it was easy for us to be able to, you know, start what we wanted. But it wasn't easy to stay on and convince people. But I'm happy we did. I think that's the only reason why I'm so privileged to say I was the vessel that God used, because he could have used any other person. But around that time, because I had connection back in the industry, we knew what was going on. I remember we would joke about, let's go back home. They are paying social person equivalent of a thousand pounds. And that was crazy money then. I said, listen, if we can get to this level, at least that we know us there. Because how can I want to compete with Lema in this place? Can I see? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? What am I? This is what they have to then. I can be myself, you know. And, and from time, um, I understood, because JGC 409 scored, I was like the last member. Mm. And in the group, they already had singers, mm -hmm. rappers, mm. songwriters, everything. So when I was coming in, I had to do everything. I was the comedian, I was the entertainer, I was, yeah. I was just, I had to just be there. So, so I think we, we and I, you get that from the privileges of, you know, living back home, having that diehard spirit. Having that, listen, it's this or nothing else. It's this or nothing else. And so that's why we went back home, 2004, and then we started. And I believe by the time we came back, our first show that they paid me was 150,000 naira to fly back. And they couldn't fly myself and Don Jazzy back. We had not moved fully. That was 2005, February. But we were so excited about the fact that they were booking us for 150,000 that time to come back home. You know, so we flew back and it, it started changing the narrative. Mm. And I remember something, they used to think it was a hobby. Your parents back home then would tell you, why do you want to do music? It's a hobby. But it was intentional for us to say, listen, it is actually a business. And it was hard, but we thank God that we're here. We today. thank God that we're here. Powerful. Okay, so, if I had questions on that side, I want to see who's got questions. That yeah, we've got someone right down here. Thank you. Yes. Don't worry, the microphone is coming, my dear. Good morning, my mom. Hello. Okay, great. Thank you all. It's been really interesting just to hear your perspectives. I've got one that probably is a little bit more controversial, but I want to hear once the one <sighs> So there's been a lot of conversation about Afro beats and that encompassing all types of African music. Yep. And there's always been some artists that have come up and say they don't consider themselves an Afro beats artist. So how do you feel about that conversation? Do you think it should be segmented and everyone should really kind of hone in on their craft with their titles, whether it be, you know, whatever it may be? Um, or should it be all encompassing? Because you think about rock and roll music, you think about pop, you think, of, 
they're not branching out. So what are your thoughts on that conversation? Uh, so can I, can I just say something quickly on that? I think, first of all, we, we, we are segmented, clearly with our sounds. You know, we've, we've spoken about um, I'm a piano and it's holding its own. We've spoken about Congolese music in Rumba and it holds its own. But I think there's always an entry point. We had these mm -hmm. great conversations a while back, especially when we started the Afrobeats chart show, mm -hmm. where, okay, why is it called Afrobeats? I said, because that's our entry point, you know? Um, a lot of us introduce ourselves as Africans before we say anything else. And then I'm Congolese, and then I'm this. And I think that unity is what's allowing for example, a burner boy to now say, do you know what, I want to perform with um, the Trella Band Boys. That kind of unity is what allows a, a, a Stormzy to then connect with one of these guys from Ghana because we are Africans first. That's the drive. You see a diamond platinum connecting with somebody from France because we're Africans first. And one thing I'm always saying is that we focus, we put our energy in the wrong things. Yep. That conversation doesn't change whether we get 10,000 listeners or 1,000 listeners. You know, we can have that conversation in our houses, but once we're presenting ourselves to the world, we need to come as a family. That's what I need to say. I want to add to That's a great one. I want to add to what you said, because of course people ask me these, but I want to ask you first, Oliver Twist. Is it an Afrobeat record? Oliver Twist for me? Yeah. It's an Afrobeat yeah. record. 100%. Okay, I'll say it's an Afropop. Okay, and that's where we go, exactly. Just and, he, and here's the thing. And, and is it under the bracket it's the of Afrobeat? Yes. So good, but as at that time, 2012, the, there was no... There was no... So, and I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's a really important yeah. uh, distinction to, to make. Because if you look at any uh, uh, genre of music, like I said a little bit earlier, it's a dirty word now to use yeah. the word urban, yeah. right? Mm. But urban was used as an umbrella term for black music. Absolutely. Mm. And it was a point where there wasn't enough black music coming through labels or, you know, being played. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, and at the point where that name became redundant, because we can actually call out what a hip hop track is, yeah. what an R&B track mm. is, what an Afrobeat, I think what we're saying is we can pivot. Absolutely. And we can actually yeah. read it. Now that there is enough of this music, yeah. we can distinguish what's I'm a piano, what's Afro piano. Don't shoot me. I just wanted to say that. So if we, obviously Af the, Af the term Afrobeats is quite new, right? Yeah. Mm. But if we was to go back into like, you know, like a library, like, you know, <laughs> since we're in. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there was like, there, there wasn't, there were songs that were floating that didn't have a title back then. Can we still say that that was Afrobeats? Because Even yes, though... Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, I would say that under yes, the umbrella, yes, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's all I want. I just wanted to know. Yeah. If I can just, <laughs> and, and if I can just add to that very, very yeah. quickly, um, historically, historically, Afrobeats is traced to the UK. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a term that emerged in the UK between 2008 and 2009 to describe African pop music of African extraction. Yes. So when the bank alluded now that music made in 2004, how I answer, answer that is, in 2004, the term Afrobeats was not there. Yeah. But in context, Whoa. in referencing it, it goes, that term Afrobeats for me, goes as far back as 1998, 1999. Mm -hmm. Because that is when this new pop sound, mm -hmm. you know, we now describe, Af that's when it really started. It just got a name in the UK in 2008, and just like urban music, there had to be an entry point. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. You know? and, and also a distinction between world yeah, music. Exactly. Because if you were making African, or a musician making <coughs> music from Africa, yes. you would be branched in world music. Which is why it makes me, and it goes back to my point, it just makes me happy that our different sounds are organically finding themselves. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where we are. And I think it will continue to happen that way as, you know, um, instead of us, you know, kind of grabbing it before it's time. Mm -hmm. That's our thing, it's a nice thing. Um, so I'm going to move on to the last question. Um, yeah, because of your hair, because of your hair. <laughs> Thank you for that, Eddie, because it's not even a question. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's you have, don't tell me you have spoken <laughs> words. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Kuda. I'm the founder of Made in Zwear. Um, yeah, so my, my, my statement, and I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. Okay. Uh, we're at a stage where I call stage one, build the thing, and you guys are build the thing. 
stage two is take up arms and that's the rest of us, we'll talk about it another day. But what I wanna say about this is, in a community that's always talking about working together, that opportunity often loses for all the reasons why. Uh, but my big sis Tappy, the people that I stand with, the, the people that I sit with, <laughs> you, <laughs> you are all here, uh, as a, as a, you stand as a testament to that vision, you know, to that shared vision. Um, of celebrating the richness of African culture in the UK, in the world. And, you know, this year, the panel we sit and everyone else in the room, you guys are like, you are a manifestation of that. And it means so much to us. Um, this is a, a, a physical manifestation and, and commitment to turning those aspirations of unity into a tangible reality. And so this here literally is just my words to say, here's to you all. Um, Here's to me and everyone that relates to my words here today, and we sincerely thank you. We were grateful for giving us voice, identity, love, culture, creativity, all that stuff. So thank you so much. My guy. Thank you for that, brother. That's very heartfelt. And on that note, um, first and foremost, the British Library, uh, you are phenomenal. Uh, thank you for this space. This is now my third time in the library. It's a <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need a card, I need a card. Um, beyond the baseline, what a great initiative. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go see the exhibition, please go and see it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. The Playmaker Group, Mr. Ray Paul, you already know what it is. It's the man. Uh, so, uh, and of course, my amazing friends and, and family on this stage here, thank you for continuing to hold my hand and making me feel like a proud, oh, making me a proud African um, every single day in your own special way as now. well. <laughs> and um, thank you guys for coming out. Um, um, there's nothing else to say, man. Keep listening to African music, whether it's Ethiopia, South Africa, Botswana, Congo, Lesotho, Cape Verde. Enjoy it. God bless you. My name is Erika Uganda. <laughs> God bless you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.